Galatians 2, 15 through 21. Verse 15. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So that we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. Through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Let's, uh, let's bow our hearts. Father, in these next few moments, I ask that you take these humble, halting words of mine and infuse them with your meaning. That you would teach your people the message you would have them to hear. And that you would, above all things, Father, glorify your name. In Christ's name. Amen. So this passage, this, uh, this section, is an exercise in compare and contrast. Now, I know we all remember our high school English teachers telling us to compare and contrast, and we all wondered why we ever had to do that. Well, here's the day. This is why. In order to understand these verses, we need to compare and contrast some things. Throughout this college, college, throughout this college, throughout this passage, Paul compares different things to show the Galatian church the difference between what has been and what is. He begins with an easy comparison. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. And immediately follows it with the parallel comparison. We know that a person is not justified by works of the law but through faith in Christ Jesus. Okay? <clears throat> now, is Paul saying that the Jews actually were justified by the works of the law? No. But that's how they acted. That's what they thought. Right? They acted like their obedience to the law was the thing that justified them. Like the, their obedience to the law was the thing that saved them. What did Jesus say to the Pharisees? He said, you are whitewashed tombs. You look pretty on the outside, but inside you're full of dead men's bones. Defiled, unholy things, right? Dead men's bones. And we remember from our Romans study... How the law itself is neither sin nor sinful, but that it is a mirror which reflects our own wretchedness back upon us. Romans chapter 7 and verse 7 says in part, What shall we say then? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. Right? And I use that wonderful illustration which you all will all never ever forget that the law is a shaving mirror. And when you look into the shaving mirror, I know you're all women, just go with it. When you look into the shaving mirror, you see what needs to be, sorry Peter, shaved. But it's not the mirror that shaves you. Ha ha ha. Ha 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 ha. Ha ha ha. Okay, thank you. Sometimes you just got to work for it. 
It's not the mirror that shaves you. It's not the mirror that saves you. It's the work of Christ that saves us, right? So the law is a mirror. It's also a spotlight, which, which illuminates the darkness inside of us. Yet I would not, yet if it had not been for the law, Paul says in Romans 7, 7, I would not have known what sin is. This is to say that without the law, we would not have known what sin was. The law is a mirror which shows us our own sinfulness, or maybe a spotlight which brings that sinfulness to our attention, but the law itself is not sinful. Allow me to chase this rabbit just a little bit further. Remember in Genesis chapter 7, verse 2, when God says to Noah, Take with you seven pairs of all clean animals, a male and his mate, and a pair of, of the animals that are not clean, the male and his mate. The distinction between clean and unclean animals isn't written down until Leviticus chapter 11, almost a thousand years later. How does Noah know which animals are clean and which are unclean? Clean and unclean existed apart from or prior to the Torah. In fact, all the law did. It was sinful for Cain to murder Abel even before the law said, you shall not murder. Right? Thus, the law doesn't create sin, it only reveals it. Like a good mirror reveals a blemish on our face, or a spotlight reveals something that's hidden in the darkness. But, in the comparison, but the comparisons continue. I'm sorry. In verse 16, Paul reiterates, in order, that, in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works in the law. Again, we're comparing faith and law. Faith and law. But not just law, but works of the law. So in verse 19, he picks it up and begins to drive these comparisons home by comparing not just sinfulness and righteousness, but life and death. For through the law I died to the law, so that I might live to God. He continues with one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible, in verse 20, by tying the comparison of righteousness and unrighteousness to the comparison of life and death. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. It's a memory verse. If you don't have this one memorized, this is your verse for the week to work on. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And as I read this from my iPad, after telling you to memorize it, I realize what a hypocrite I must look like. However, I memorized it in a different translation, so we're still good. But I want to, I want to stick with the same translation for the message. I have the New International Version verse of that memorized. I have been crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live, but Jesus Christ now lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith through the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. But in verse 21, he explains this life, death, righteousness, unrighteousness comparison. He says, I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. All right, now that we've seen the relatively comparative structure of the passage, let's look a little bit more closely at each verse. Verse 15. We ourselves by, are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. First question we get to ask ourselves is, who is the we of whom Paul is speaking? Now, often we will be told that the we, this is the royal we, right? Um, that um, the, the Queen of England will frequently use. Um, and what it does is it uh, elevates the position of the speaker, right? So the Queen of England has absolutely every right to use this we when she says we are not amused, right? 
But where did that originate? The usage of the royal we is less than 150 years old. It's common vernacular now. We all understand the usage of the, the royal we. But because it is such a new concept, relatively speaking, Paul is not using the royal we. He is not elevating himself to the position of a king or a lord, right? So when people tell you that Paul is using the royal we here, or that God, in Genesis chapter 1 verse 27, is using the royal we when he says, let us make man in our image, we have a problem. I think Paul is continuing his recounting of his conversation with Peter. Let's pick up a bit of the context. Beginning at verse 11, it says, But when Kephas, that is Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him. So that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Kephas before, all, before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? Now some English translations will end the quotation after that point, and the, the ESV does. God bless the NIV. It wins points here. It continues the quotation further on. Now, what does the original Greek say? It's silent on this matter. The original Greek didn't use quotation marks. <clears throat> uh, I think Paul is still talking to Peter when he says, we who are Jews by birth. Right? So he says, in verse 14, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you... My iPad just reset itself. I'm sorry. Um, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? Then he says... We who are Jews. I think he's still talking to Peter. Or he's rather recounting his conversation <clears throat> with Peter. The churches to whom Paul was writing in Galatia were, were in what we would today call modern Turkey. That is, Galatia is approximately 200 miles north of the northern border of modern day Israel. These were Gentile believers, not former Jews. So it doesn't make sense for the we to re uh, refer to Paul and the Galatians. It may refer to Paul and the men with him, but that seems a bit of a stretch, I think, considering Paul's usage of the per first person pronoun, I, in much of the rest of his letter. Keep doing that. All right. So Paul is railing against the Jews in verse 15. Uh, Paul, what is Paul railing against in verse 15? At about this time, there are groups of pseudo-Christians known as Judaizers. They're traveling around to churches and trying to convince the believers that they must first become Jewish in order to become real Christians. What is involved in becoming Jewish? The first thing is circumcision, and then an adherence to the Jewish law, as a method of salvation. I've even seen this myself in today. In some of the darker corners of the Hebrew roots movement. There are people who have found such truth in the Hebrew scriptures. That they've begun to ask if the New Testament is true. Or if Jesus is necessary. I've had discussions with former Christians. Who have decided that Jesus was just a story. Not a real person. And that the things reported in the New Testament are just fiction. But that the true God of the universe is only revealed through the Hebrew scriptures. 
Here, in the second chapter of Galatians, Paul is dealing with the roots of that same idea. Now, let me be absolutely clear. There is no salvation apart from the saving work of Jesus Christ upon the cross. But there never has been. Not for us today, not for the twelve apostles, not for John the Baptist, not even for Moses. Salvation is by faith, as we see in this passage, and we will see again throughout the rest of Galatians. But we have a tendency to swing to extremes. If a little is good, then a lot must be better. And the Old Testament is the basis for all of morality in Western cultures. Murder, theft, adultery, lying, respect for elders, all these are enshrined in the Ten Commandments. We know beyond any doubt that these things are wrong because God has told us that they're wrong, right? But the Old Testament is a big book and it's not always easy to understand. So when we read a verse like Leviticus 19.28, which reads, You shall not make any cuts on your body for the dead or tattoo yourselves, I am the Lord. We suddenly jump up and say, "Ah, oh, tattoos are evil. Right? We don't take that to its logical conclusion and say, well, we shouldn't allow surgery either because that's making a cut on the body, right? Because we realize that surgery is a good thing. But since we can see no reason for tattoos, they must be evil, even though both things are apparently prohibited in the same verse. The problem is that's not what the verse is prohibiting. You shall not make any cuts on your body for the dead or tattoo yourselves. What's it talking about? It's talking about ancestor worship. It's talking about doing these things as part of pagan rituals. Are we allowed to have surgery to make cuts on our body? Yes, absolutely. Because this is a good thing. It promotes life. Are we allowed to make cuts on our body as part of a pagan ritual? No, absolutely not. Are we allowed to have tattoos? Yeah, I think so. Are we... (laughs) Did I just settle a bet or something? Are we allowed to have tattoos as part of pagan rituals? No. No. Okay. Right, But we're Americans. We don't do it halfway. And we oftentimes don't read the whole verse. So we, we, we keep, we, we have this, this hard charging gung-ho mentality. Right? We do the same thing in, in other verses like Exodus chapter 20 verse 4. Which reads, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness or of any... Um, I'm sorry, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. I don't know why that was so hard for me to read. And that verse alone has spawned entire movements and denominations. For instance, some of the Protestant reformers, in particular, Andreas Karlstadt, born 1486, Huldrych Zwingli, born 1484, and John Calvin, born in 1509, encouraged the removal of religious images invoked by the Ten Commandments, prohibition of idolatry, and the manufacture of graven, that is, sculpted images of God. As a result, individuals attacked statues and images. However, in most cases, civil authorities removed the images in an orderly manner, in the newly reformed Protestant cities and territories of Europe. These people were called iconoclasts. They went about destroying statues. Significant iconoclastic riots took place in Zurich, Copenhagen, Munster, Geneva, Augsburg, Scotland, Rouen, and uh, and Saints, and La Rochelle. Um, All of these in the 16th century. The 17 provinces, now known as uh, the Netherlands, Belgium, and parts of northern France, were disrupted by the widespread Protestant iconoclasm in the summer of 1566. This is people with rocks and hammers rushing into churches and destroying statues. 
Why? Well, because of Exodus chapter 20, verse 4, which says, you shall not make for yourself any carved image, right? Right? So, if I'm going to cut off a piece of butter, and I, I, I cut the butter, and I'm scraping it on my toast, and I look, and I happen to see that the shape of the butter that I left in the tub vaguely resembles Elvis's hair, Have I made for myself a carved image of butter? What does the verse actually say? The verse actually says, You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them for I the Lord your God am a jealous God. Here, in this commandment, God is not prohibiting statues. He is prohibiting the worship of statues. Even statues intended to represent Him. Don't bow down to statues. Don't worship pictures. Don't worship idols. But as I said, we have a tendency to go to extremes. If a little is good, a lot must be better. And I, in that respect, I guess, we're a lot like the Christians in Galatia. We see a good thing in the Old Testament, we distort it, and then we run with it. Deuteronomy 22 verse 5 is a big one for Americans. Deuteronomy 22 verse 5 says, A woman shall not wear a man's garment nor shall a man er, put on a woman's cloak. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord your God. We've all felt the sting of that verse. However, in the 1980s, I attended churches that would not allow women to wear slacks or cut their hair. They all had to wear dresses. Then, one day, I went to the pastor after the service, and I pointed to a picture of Jesus on the wall and I said he's wearing a dress shouldn't we wear dresses too we should move on verse 16 then we know that uh, it's uh, yet we know that a person is not justified by the works of the law but through faith in Jesus Christ so that we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. That's a mouthful. But here Paul is saying that even though he and Peter are Jews, we know, that is, we already know, that a person is not counted as righteous because of the works of the law, but rather through faith. How do we, that is, how do Peter and Paul and the rest of the Jews already know this? Before the law was fully given, that is, before the Torah was written down, Noah is called righteous in Genesis chapter 6 verse 9. A few chapters later, Abraham, uh, in, in few, I'm sorry, in a few chapters later in Genesis 15 6, we read of Abraham and he believed the Lord and he counted it to him. As righteousness. Thus we have early testimony that righteousness comes through faith. And that obedience follows righteousness. Noah obeyed by building the ark. Abraham obeyed by offering Isaac. But both men first believed what God told them. And then they acted. Verses 17 and 18. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. That is, if our sinfulness is revealed to us, we too were found to be sinners, then we, uh, when we seek our justification in Christ... Does that mean that Christ makes sin into righteousness? 
That is, does Christ make sin good? Certainly not, Paul says. This is the kind of objection someone might raise after a single reading of the passage. Oh, gee, since Jesus justifies sinners, doesn't that mean that Jesus makes it okay to sin? And you'll hear idiots offer this objection. I hear idiots offer this objection about twice a month. They're idiots. Of course not, Paul says. This objection rests in a lack of understanding of what sin is and what Christ does. Yes, a sin is an action that we commit, such as lying or theft. But sin as an entity or institution itself is separation from God in a fundamental way. Right? <clears throat> we commit a sin... And that brings upon us a sinful state. We are in sin because we have committed sin. What does it mean to be in sin? It means to be unrighteous. <clears throat> we cannot be united with God in any meaningful way while we are unrighteous because God is holy. What Christ does is not to make sin okay, but to defeat sin. It's the difference between making peace with someone with whom you are at war, such as the United States and ISIS sitting down to sign a peace agreement, right? Or destroying them utterly. When God tells Joshua to destroy the Canaanites, for example, he does not say, go in and live peacefully among them. He says, slaughter everything that draws breath. It's this, in the same way, Christ does not make it okay for us to sin. Christ pays the penalty for our sin to, in a sense, balance our account. We are made righteous before God and our debt is canceled by what Christ has done. Now, what does it mean to be made righteous? What does it mean to be justified? When we become justified before God, it is as if we had never sinned. I'm justified just as if I had never sinned. Right? So, the sin that puts us into the sinful state, that is, that separation from God, is removed when I am justified. And I, I'm using a generic I. When we are justified, it is as if we had never sinned. Now, verse 18 says, For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. About what is Paul talking? What is he talking about rebuilding or what was torn down? He's talking about sinfulness. Christ tears down the barrier between us and God. That thing which separates us. Our unrighteousness. Christ tears that down. He doesn't give us a license to continue sinning. And if we do continue sinning, we rebuild what Christ has torn down. And, according to Paul, prove ourselves to be transgressors. Now, this is tough. Because each and every one of you are sitting there thinking, I'm justified and I've accepted Christ and I do the best I can to live a holy life and I still sin. I was thinking the same thing as I was writing this, and so I know what you're thinking. How is it possible, then, for us to not rebuild that wall of sinfulness? Fortunately, Paul tells us in the very next verse, so we don't have to keep wondering. The very next verse, verse 19, For through the law I died to the law, so that I might live to God. From our study of Romans chapter 7, we, uh, we remember Paul goes into significantly greater detail on what it means to die to the law. We remember from our Roman study the image of the bride married to her husband. 
If she takes another man while her husband is alive, she commits adultery. But if her husband dies, Paul says, she is free to remarry. The law of adultery no longer has sway over her. So verse 20 continues the explanation. It says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. But Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the son of God. Who loved me and gave himself for me. We died. Paul says. We died on the cross with Christ. We died to the law which condemns us. Just as the bride is released from the law of adultery when her husband passes. Thus, when we in our flesh continue to sin, even though we do not want to do it, it is no longer we who sin. You see? Jesus says in Mark chapter 7, verse 15, there is nothing outside a person um, that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. If the thing that comes from within a person is the thing that defiles him, it is the heart that matters. What do you desire? When we were unrepentant, unregenerate sinners, we did not desire to please God. We couldn't care less about God. We desired only to please ourselves. And so sinfulness started inside of us and flowed out through our hands and our lips and our feet. But now that we have the indwelling Holy Spirit, what is inside of us desires to please God. Since... Um, uh, Romans chapter 7 verse 20. Now if I do what I do not want. It is no longer I who do it. I want to be free from sin. I want to no longer sin. I want to please God. I want to be an example of his righteousness. It is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. So, when we sin against our own desires, it is not us who are sinning. It is not us who are rebuilding the wall between ourselves and God. It is not us who are continuing this separation from God. Indeed, Christ has already done the work on the cross to eliminate that barrier. Verse 21, Paul concludes this portion of his argument, I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. That is, if anyone could be saved by obedience to the law, there's no reason for Christ. But righteousness is through faith. We are not made righteous through the law. Does this mean that the law is evil? No. Does this mean that we should break the law? No. John Wesley said, I observed love is the fulfilling of the law, the end of the commandment. It's not only the first and great commandment, but all the commandments in one. Whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, they are all comprised in this one word. Love. We can no more abandon the law of God than we can abandon love. But we are not saved by our obedience to the law. Just as Moses and Abraham were not made righteous by their obedience. They obeyed because they were made righteous. We're not saved by our obedience to the law. We are saved by faith in God and the works of Christ. Now, very briefly, let me close. Verse 22. 
if we were saved because of our belief, if God had made it any harder, there would be people who couldn't do it. If God had said, you have to believe and stand on your head every Tuesday, I would have been great as a teenager. I could stand on my head. Not so much anymore. I would have been unredeemable if God had added that one thing. Believe and stand on your head every Tuesday. But he didn't. The whole of the requirement for salvation, all that you need to be saved, is to believe. Believe in your heart. And confess with your mouth. Because if you believe, confession will flow from it. You cannot deny what you believe. And that's it. That's all you have to do. Now, because you have been made righteous through your belief, you get to obey the law. You get to obey the law. The, the, the commandments. But it's truly you who does it. And not the flesh. And not the sinful nature around you. Very thick stuff. And I hope some of it made sense. Let's bow our hearts.